This isn't the CSC Zoom room? I, I, I didn't know whose it was, but it is CSC's. Um, Collective Sense Common, by the way, has has a shared Zoom uh, account. Um, uh, talk, talk to me later if you want to join up and chip in for paying for a shared Zoom account. Um, uh, so we've got the data out. Uh, it can turn into HTML, or it can turn into a massive wiki, or it can turn into a tiddly wiki, or it can turn, you know, different ways. Um, so then there's a guy, uh, a guy and a small team. Mark Trexler uh, is leads something called the Climate Web, where he's got another couple hundred thousand uh, linked thoughts. Um, Jerry does this interesting thing where all he does is, is keep track of the names of the topics, basically, and, and a few URLs. Mostly, it's just the names of the topics that Jerry has, um, which is one way that you can use the brain. It's kind of an idiosyncratic way to use it, and it's been super generative for Jerry. But when we turn it into a massive wiki or whatever we turn it into, there's going to be a whole opportunity for people to go in and under the, each of the titles, um, uh, you know, start to fill out, you know, this is what, you know, this means, this is what uh, data no information knowledge means, this is what um, Doug Engelbart means, or, you know, bootstrap society or whatever, right? Um, climate web is different. Uh, it's, it was a bunch of climatologists who started on it, I think, like 10 years ago, and they've got literally hundreds of thousands of things. Each thought for them is a whole, like, um, uh, almost like a book chapter. Um, is somewhere between a page and a chapter of stuff that's about climate, right? And um, so they they offer that information up to the public, um, but you can only kind of see it through the web interface of the brain, which is clunky. Um, or they've also they've got a freemium model where um, you can pay them for a better curation or a better slice. Uh, so they have something called the Climate MBA and the Climate PhD focused on business, focused on science and tech, you know, so if you want to know everything the world knows about carbon capture in the EU and the laws around that, you actually want to go to the climate web and it's all there, right? So they're, they're looking at ways. Um, so this, this has grown out of Free Jerry's brain a little bit into, you know, what, what do we do with the capability of being able to, to slice and dice uh, the brain and the climate web and Jerry's brain and do stuff with it, right? Um, Mark, Mark and I have worked on setting up what he calls microsites. Um, I guess he got that terminology from me. Why don't we just have a little focused course about, um, you know, what carbon capture means, and and it ends up being a website that's like a, a small ebook sized thing that tells you everything that you want to know and the backward, you know, the the back and forth of the arguments and things like that. Um, he is starting to be interested in, and I don't know who else on this call knows about this. Um, he is one of the people focusing on what he calls monetization of chunks of, of the brain, right, of, of his climate web. Um, so, by the way, I, I probably a bunch of us are allergic to capitalism and, and even potentially revenue and things like that. Mark is on the, on the, um, uh, he's, uh, he's on the side of the good, the good side. Um, trying to figure out the Star Wars thing. There's the um, the dark side. Jedi? And they don't call it, they don't call it the light side, right? It's just the other side, the good guys, the Jedi. Um, anyway, he's, he's one of the good ones, even though he's also talking about monetizing chunks of the climate web. It's so that he can survive and do more of the stuff that he needs to do, right? He's also coming from a place where the, the, his organization has got uh, a revenue model for it already. And he's already putting stuff out totally in the commons and also monetizing it by curation and focused you know, work and consulting on top of that and things like that. So anyway, there's a few of us coming out of the Free Jerry's brain thing where we're talking about what does monetization look like? What does, you know, um, and, and doing it together in the commons. By the way, this reminds me, there's also a conversation going on about IP, intellectual property, and how to do that commons thing. Let's put it in the commons. Let's make sure that we don't get sued by a capitalist because we put it in the commons. Um, and let's, you know, have some um, uh, some ways that that 
we can make money virtuously um, instead of anti-virtuously. Um, that is happening right now with OGM and Lionsburg, and I just recruited Lorelei into that. Lorelei is going to be a superpower uh, for this. Um, uh, so, and and Kiko Lab is deep in this conversation and actually started a lot of the you know the they pushed the buttons like, okay, this is a thing that we need to figure out. Let's figure it out. Lionsburg is also super energized about that now. Um, I guess that's it for now. I, 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 I don't even remember what I, where, where I launched. Oh, thanks, Charles, uh, talking about Free Jerry's Brain. Free Jerry's Brain is an interesting group. Um, and it's right now, it's kind of nominally part of OGM. Um, and some of us think it will stay that way, and some of us think it needs to grow up a little bit and grow out um, uh, uh, out of you know its OGM nursery and into bigger stuff. So I have wondered actually if Free Jerry's Brain and Flotilla are going to kind of merge, or if Flotilla is going to take on the parts of Free Jerry's Brain that is you know beyond the where um, Free Jerry's Brain is is got passion and capability. So. Flotilla is Vincent and I talking about data interoperability, um, data federation, um, uh, and, and me. Then, excuse me, and Charles, and me, um, and um, and Charles, and um, uh, and uh, and with a focus, the original focus of Flotilla was really around directories and what we call matchmaking, um, people using directories as a way. Um, uh, especially, I, I don't. I don't know how much Vincent shares this, but I've got a, a con concept conceptualization of directories that you actually need a, a human layer of matchmakers, people who are really good at data and data mining and stuff like that, and can connect. You know, um, individuals that wouldn't otherwise connect, even if they had the technology of a directory, they might not have the, the superpower of using the, the directory well. So then there's people with superpower, you know, directory superpowers that help other people um, uh, work that. So so then, then from Flotilla, you can see Trove in one direction and Massive kind of in another direction. I got a question for you on everything that you just talked about there that um, have you been able to try to put any of that into practice with people to do the things that you're trying to do with the tools that you described or even just like marginally or like even some incremental progress in yeah so f the the free jerry's brain project um and really it was me and mark antoine um uh, we cracked the code on the the brain data formats enough to turn that into a postgres database um mm -hmm. Uh, and then also into microsites, HTML chunks of, of the climate web. Um, and I, I did that both for HTML and TiddlyWiki and now Massive. So there's also cool. massive abstracts of the climate web. Um, Mark is, those are up on, I think it's climatesites.net. Um, Mark has got, uh, um, I, I, don't, I don't know that I would quite say commercial success. Um, but uh, this is a, now a product of the climatographers. Um, the climatographers is his company or, or sovereign or whatever um, that, that commercializes it. So it's essentially commercializing data from the brain through microsites, uh, HTML microsites, and that's up and running. Um, Massive is this weird little thing where, or weird big thing. Um, Massive, the, so um, the mission of Massive is to, let me, actually, I'll just read it kind of. So the idea of Massive is that we wanted, or I, especially Sam, since you're here, what we, we had this weird conflation when we invented wikis, um, Ward, Ward invented wikis, and then a bunch of us did stuff around them. The, what happened was it, 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 it centralized because there was only one place the software and the database was running. Everybody comes to C2 Wiki or Meatball Wiki. Um, and then we kind of like forgot that, you know, or we didn't realize or it wasn't the time yet or something like that. So Massive Wiki is the idea that, um, 
that the wiki is actually not the server and the database, it's actually the pages. And then when you think of it that way, it's like, well, the pages can kind of float around and be in different wikis pretty quickly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, uh, leveraging um, the software technology world, um, all Massive is, is, um, hey, why don't you use Markdown files and uh, Git um, and call that a wiki. So that's really sure. all that Massive is, right? So Massive Wiki, the movement on top of that goes, okay, then how do you teach people how to use Markdown? What tools do you recommend? How do you get them to approach Markdown so that they get it? Um, and then how do you um, how do you hide Git enough and GitHub enough so that normal people can use it instead of software developers, right? So that's the 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 task. The first task of Massive Wiki is just solving those problems. So we've got a few regular people who can kind of use Massive Wiki right now. Um, mm -hmm, we've mm -hmm. simplified the Git part enough so that it's easy to use, and we're leaning on Obsidian, which is a commercial but generally friendly company um, that makes software that you can use to look at a massive wiki as a whole thing rather than that, yeah that that's cool you know in in the wiki communities that you talked about where you said there's like the original wiki and meatball wiki and then there was a community that came off of meatball wiki called community wiki and off of that we made this wiki farm system and we figured out how to integrate like dozens and dozens of wikis and that was kind of along the lines of what you're talking about and one of the walls we hit doing that in like 2006 was that eventually you have to actually like sit down with people on a person to person basis. And it's not enough from our findings at that time, it wasn't enough to just data mine the uh, that's where I was really getting at was like, are you able with just data mining data alone, able to give useful recommendations to people as someone doing that now, it's my impression that you could do that but you would also need a discussion like this one to really orient people with what you're actually trying to get at. So if it was just the data mining alone um, that other people may not really understand, like, hmm, why is this recommended to me? Like, what, how is, what is, metaphor can I connect this with? What insight can I value? Can I take from this? And it seemed like a combination of per interpersonal human being talking to each other, sense making combined with that data mining would probably lead to the outcome. And I'm wondering, uh, am I wrong about that? Number one, because that seemed to be like what it, the experience that I was finding and exploring the stuff and or number, maybe I'm wrong about this now and somehow just kind of working with data and recommendations that are coming from software alone actually has yeah. good effectiveness. So, um... Uh, maybe we can kind of segue into, um, uh, hang on just a sec. I'm supposed to be in another meeting. I'm going to tell them to go away. Thank you for making this space, Peter. This is a conversation I've been waiting to have for quite a long time. So I feel really grateful that we're here. Awesome. Um, so it's it's interesting, Sam, that that you 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 went to data mining. So I I started I started the idea with Massive Wiki. It turns out that it's really going to be massive. Um, and uh, one of the I, I think the 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 growth from Massive Wiki out uh, right now is called the Massive Human Intelligence Project. Um, and it's the idea that it doesn't have to be a wiki, but if we, if we do, if we do, you know, if we federate information, probably markdown files still, let's get a bunch of systems federating, federating data and doing things like data mining and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, for me personally, um, separate from Massive or Massive Wiki, for me personally, um, uh, which is a weird way to say it, but like Massive is going to be all a lot of data mining. For me personally, I don't really, I'm not interested in the data mining part of it at all. It has nothing to mm. do with where I where I am at. And okay. for me, it's all around hu uh, humans in community. So the thing that 
I'm trying to the 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 like a, a main focus of massive and massive wiki is just to get regular people to do the thing that the fork and pull model does for software for open source. Mm -hmm. um, it's like so all of these you know if if you had um, there was an original concept of massive by the way it was uh, spelled funny it was uh, M M A from markdown and S V F for shared version files so you have a mar massive wiki if you're sharing the files and if they're versioned so you have version history and if they're files it's more than one file it's multiple files and it's also in a compact form that any computer can use right um, so break the information down into the most simple text, you know, uh, up, slightly upgraded text that you can. And if it's plain text, it's actually fine. And then put it in files that any computers and anybody with a computer can do in the ways that they do all their other JPEGs and PNGs and doc files and stuff like that, right? It's just .md, you know, but then it's a file. You know how to use files. You know how to put them in directories. You know how to tag them. You know how to, you know, with whatever system you've got. So, um, so then on top of that, it's like mash that up with GitHub. And I'm not saying GitHub. So GitHub, we've got a problem with GitHub in that Microsoft bought it and that it's a, a commercial entity and that it's, you know, a centralizer. Mm -hmm. But a different way of looking at GitHub is it was this cool thing that that popularized the idea of fork and pull and mm -hmm. changed the way that we do open source, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. fork and pull means that I'm, I've got an, an information asset and if I put it into the commons of open source, um, then fork and pull means that anybody can grab it and they have a complete copy of it. Anybody can grab it and start collaborating with me without me even knowing about it. And I still have the membrane of uh, my community where if somebody says, oh dude, I did such a wonderful thing to your information asset and I want, to, I want you to merge it back, I have complete control over that, right? They can't push it back. I have to pull it back. They do a pull request and then I pull it into my stuff if it's good enough. And then on top of that, GitHub has fine-grained collaboration features around that, right? It turns out that, uh, you know, in a pull request, I can go through each file and on each line, I can say, this needs to be improved or I'm not going to take this. I'm going to revert it to my version instead of your version, all that kind of stuff, right? Massive Wiki is nowhere near doing any of that yet, but that's where it's going. It's, it's, it's creating those social abilities it, it you know all of that is social stuff right all of that stuff that software developers do do through github they're doing it with a lot of technological mediation but it's a, so, a social process right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i want to copy all of your stuff i want to change your stuff i want to offer it back to you and then we have the social collaboration about that mediated by github right yeah, i don't yeah. want this line i want that line yeah. so you, you know what's really cool about that peter i'm sorry to interrupt you i just you got me thinking that a lot of a lot of people a large volume of people came to understand the concept of search between the early 1990 and let's say now and that would probably they probably wouldn't have totally understood that without living with it and using it and also, I guess they understood, they adapted and understood things that you probably wouldn't have guessed that they would have, like HTTP and using a complex. It's funny that sometimes over here, people will say like, oh, you can't make this software for people. You know, it's too complicated. And then you look at something like a browser and you're like, wait a minute. Every When people had an incentive to understand all these things, it became nothing for them to understand that software and all the stuff that you can do with a browser. You know, yep. you could make a whole different software that has about the same amount of complicated and complexity profile but if it if they don't understand the value then they're just like that's you know question mark i can't use that it's that's too hard for me to use but it, yep. but it didn't seem to be a problem with browsers with apps with the settings that are inside of a of an iphone and blah, blah 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 all this stuff if there's a value that they can connect it um and i think you're on a track of saying like there's this other concept of branching and merging that you could also get value out of and you're trying to figure out how to make it like someone did with with the browser and then in turn with like google search or, or whatever search you know application was up on a website that um and, and it probably would boil down to 
somebody not necessarily understanding like Git and 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 some of the more complicated topics, but understanding when they do these actions, these things will happen that are valuable to them. Um, and anyway, I just thought I'd reflect that. I feel like Thanks. it also, that's, that's the, helpful. Yeah. the other thing is like, it, it, to me as a backend, even if, if I was a non-technical user and I didn't know anything about Git, but you chose that and you somehow were able to obscure that away from me, it would be a great choice because you could create many options for how I could host that backend for each wiki instead of just GitHub. So I could I can spin yep. up a server today and serve a Git repository and have you pushing and pulling from it as you already know. And, but if I put my if I pretend like I don't know anything about that and you just say, hey, I've got this thing called massive or not even massive wiki, but you just call it massive. You don't yep. want to confuse me with wiki maybe, you know, yep. Um, yep. that you could potentially make it so that it's this is basically saying this this can be hosted anywhere and and you can collaborate and and interoperate with people and really then it would boil down to the affordances of if i put pages into this thing and then how what do i how do i get connected with other people as a non technical user as a person that doesn't know the infrastructure and doesn't know all this you know stuff which i do but i'm just saying i try to like pretend yep. like i don't and think about that yep. um, but i think you're on a, a good track that would be seems like the next step it's like okay let's pretend i'm just some guy that doesn't know jack about any of this so I, you know, basically this is already happening. Um, it's it's still at the beginning or sort of the early baby steps, um, but actually there are a number of people um, from OGM. I think Judy is sort of the first candidate I'm thinking about. Who you know, anyway, without going into detail, um, Pete is is marvelously doing exactly that sort of this general overview onboarding um, in a very gentle but consistent and uh, pretty thorough way. So, just saying, it's great. That's cool. We had a we had a hot seat on on actually not the Git part of it, just the wiki part of it, which is a, another mind blower for people. But we we had a hot seat on the wiki part of it um, this Monday in Kika Lab. You know, somebody subscribed me to the OGM list like a couple of three, four months ago. I don't know how they did that, but they did. And I haven't participated at all. But once in a while I read and it's pretty valuable discussion happening there and some pretty amazing stuff going on there all, so all the fun stuff happens on the chat system oh does it okay okay mostly matter most but then there's actually a discourse it's kind of complicated when you get into it but but the list is, is still flurrying and uh waving the the problem with the list is it it doesn't hold very much conversation um mm -hmm. you can't think about too many things at once and and it, and it gets overwhelmed by the the person who could speak loudest, which is usually a white old white guy. Um, uh, so so a, another thing, right right on on what you were just saying, Sam. Um, Wendy Elford, who I bumped into in Kika Lab, actually, uh, Wendy Elford has is starting to work with me on the onboarding of people into to, into Massive Wiki. You know, and there's a bunch of stuff like, is my, you know, am I going, am I going to make stupid mistakes and look stupid? You know, um, uh, how do I get a little bit of information in there, you know, without too much work? Um, you know, uh, why, why, why isn't, why am I not going to screw everybody up when I start making changes? Isn't I, aren't I going to, you know, screw up things and, and delete stuff for people? So we're working through the questions. You know, all of us here kind of know the answers to those questions. But if you just come to Massive Wiki and somebody says, "Oh, start editing and start linking as you think," and you know, blah blah blah, and it's like that's all like Greek, right? So we're gonna mm -hmm. have to chop all of that up and and move through it. Yeah, that's that's the other thing is like the concept of a page and like why do I, why would I make links out of what I'm thinking about, and what. Why should I put this in here? Why shouldn't I just write it down in the document or whatever? Or, you know, and um, I, I um, this week I, I, I grabbed something. Then I, I, I call it chunking. So you know, how do you pick the chunks of a, of a long information stream of flow, like all of the links that you're going to look at today, or this meeting or something like that, how do you break it into ch manageable chunks, right? Mm -hmm. What do you put on this page versus that page? What do you put under a heading, um, you know, and what are the headings? Um, when do you use bullets and when do you use a paragraph? All of that stuff, you know, 
a lot of us here have done that over and over and over and it's become second nature but for a lot of people coming into it you know it's it's a complete mess and i remember like wondering you know how do i capture meeting notes you know um how do i you know how do i structure a document that's all like stuff that you have to kind of bring people up to up to speed yeah Vincent, I we we started bumping into data mining and which I know that Trove isn't all about data mining, but we started bumping into data mining and a big collection of knowledge and and also finding people and finding the right things and stuff like that. And so I want to hear more about Trove. Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll give a super brief intro just for Sam because I think everyone else here knows me. Um, but yeah, so. I kind of came into the this problem space actually through a fellowship program um, doing ecosystem mapping for university setting and ended up creating a, basically a directory system for the campus that was run by uh, like a group of students. Um, and that group of students was kind of across disciplines across years. So we had some freshmen, some seniors, some grad students um, and the kind of goal was to have where you go into a university setting and after four years, all this embodied knowledge about the place, the people, the clubs, the professors, the all that stuff kind of just gets lost. And so how do you kind of like pass it on in a way that this knowledge can be um, kind of constantly built upon and not just like a very linear, you know, path of, of, of learning it and then kind of losing it. And so we created a club called Ties, which was a technology, um, innovation, entrepreneurship society. And it was kind of like using technology to be able to connect information across the whole campus. Um, and then ended up, yeah, kind of after graduating, realizing, oh, wait, okay, this problem is actually way bigger than the campus setting. Actually, it's way harder to find what's going on, uh, who's who, and what are my opportunities to to get involved when you're not in a, in a one mile radius of thousands of like minded people. And so that's kind of what spurred working on uh, what was initially called indexer and then catalyst and now trove, which is basically um, I've been working on various different prototypes of systems to be able to um, give communities and groups the ability to um, basically builds collective intelligence by curating directories together. Um, and so that right now that those directories are kind of like member directory project events. Um, and the kind of big one is like resources, which connects to, um, I guess, the kind of like data um, crawling and, and scrubbing and mining. And um, I've also been thinking about it from a very human perspective of like, how like I have a lot of friends in the entrepreneurial community that have lists of you know startup funding resources and then I ended up kind of creating like a master list that that took all the taxonomies of their spreadsheets with all these like startup funding sources and then put them all together so it can all fit in one giant database that you can filter and sort and find exactly what you're looking for. Um, and so now I have a list of like 1300 accelerators, grants, incubators, and I have them on like a map and you can filter by deadline date and, and week. And so um, I guess I kind of have my own version of the brain, but I actually am using Airtable as the back end. And then I've been playing with different tools to take the data out of Airtable and to, to try to visualize it in really compelling and interesting ways. Um, and in ways that it can be kind of crowdsourced and you could have multiple people collaborating on these these knowledge bases. And so um, I think how I've been thinking about the kind of um, data coming in is it needs to come in with a high enough quality and context. So like kind of with along with like warm data, how do you how do you um, catalog data in a way that it doesn't lose its context? And so one of the kind of approaches uh, that I've been taking is um, I made a bot that listens in our Discord or like Telegram and it pulls out links anytime someone posts a URL. And if you put like hashtags, it'll like tag those as topics. If you put an emoji, it'll know, okay, this is a book emoji, this is a book. 
Um, and then also um, it'll have the context of what somebody said about this link when they posted it. Um, and it'll also make it easy to go back. And then that from there, it can do some pulling. It'll go and it'll grab the, the metadata, the meta description and image. Um, you know, it'll see if there's another um, link that was already curated that has information it could pull from the database. And then this concept of like, okay, then that's only the beginning. Then making it easy for people to kind of revisit the data that they've curated and add on top of it and make it higher quality, adding a location, adding relevant, um, you know, uh, tags such as like, who would this be useful for? Like, oh, this would be useful for anyone who's like a mind mapper or a, um, or a social entrepreneur. And, and that input of high quality data that's contextual and also community oriented is what kind of allows you to do the matchmaking because the matchmaking, you can't have high quality matchmaking without the kind of context, without having a, a prediction algorithm and doing it like Facebook is doing it, where they just collect everything that they can and then try to make some algorithm to predict what you're going to want instead of giving people control of saying, this is exactly what I'm looking for and having the data be rich enough that semantically you can do those connections without algorithms. Yeah, no, I, that, you know, it's funny that you mentioned this and I am sorry that I keep chiming in on all this stuff, but um, there's a person at University of Pittsburgh that's doing exactly what you're describing. And I was about ready to help them do this. And I was about ready to try to build something to do what you're talking about doing. Um, anyway, maybe I should talk with you sometime about what you've already done and, and look at that versus building something on my own. But I, I also was starting to look into graph databases and recommendation systems that come out of them. And I was done some experiments trying to apply that in real world context. And that's where the feedback that I was giving to Peter came from as far as like realizing that you can get a lot of good recommendations from those algorithms, but that every everything's always situational with people, you know? And so then you usually have to basically sit down and talk to them and say like, okay, what are you doing? And what is the outcome you're hoping for? And what is all the issues? And just basically have a discussion in each time and then, but a lot of times, if you have the system that you're talking about, you can keep mapping that in as another nuance to the same, you know, um, to the same hierarchical knowledge structure. So it's not like, so everything you're doing is still massively valuable, but it's usually worth having a parallel effort where you can have these discussions with people and, and keep understanding because uh, it's all evolving and changing. It's not static. It's in an environment yeah. where everything is, is co-evolutionary. And sometimes the patterns fit and sometimes they might not and so on. And, but if people, if you have all that in place, you know, you're going to have a lot better chance of helping people understand who's doing what and why and how, what you're talking about, Vincent, than if you didn't have, if you just, if we just keep talking to each other and saying like, oh yeah, we walk away from the discussion. Like this was a great discussion. I learned a lot, but you actually can't go back and look at like when people had these discussions before or even what they did to solve yeah. the problem in the past. So I totally, I'm totally on board with what you're, it's like, I'm basically, I think that what Lauren and Charles do with Kiko lab mixed with what we're talking about is like a great, and what Peter's talking about too is a great total system for trying that you could probably apply to most human problem solving, including where people have a spectrum of worldviews where they're either more oriented towards working together or more oriented towards um, being an individual that masters everything and then brings it back to the world. Um, anyway, I just, that's just some thoughts. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Nice to meet you. We think yeah. so too. Nice Sam. to meet you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll mention just one, one thing briefly, Sam, to your previous question of like, um, how I feel about uh, a lot of the groups. So there's like Kiko Lab and OGM and there's Radish um, and there's the GRC and there's Gaia Net and there's Gaia Fest. And um, there's a, a lot, <laughs> we, can, we can go on. But so a lot of these groups uh, are, are not just communities they're, and not just networks, they're network of networks. But it also seems to me that when you have a network of network, the people that end up um, kind of being pulled closest to the, the center of the nucleus um, are of somewhat of a, 
uh, aligned worldview and kind of a, approach. Um, and so even within each network of network, because of just like, I don't know, maybe the Dunbar number or whatever, the, the core group seems to have its own flavor, which if you compare the core group of each network of network, they're different enough that they kind of are starting to silo again in some ways. Um, and so, um, I mean, how, how I've been kind of thinking about uh, the knowledge, being able to be collected within communities um, and being able to be collected in networks that have multiple communities, but also across communities that are not tied by any um, kind of like social relationships, but just more about kind of interests. And so um, how can, if there are a thousand, um, you know, agriculture groups and a and hundred of them are, you know, associated with the UN and a hundred of them are associated with um, this like, you know, permaculture movement, how can they still share data because they're interested in agriculture and in soil health and that soil health should the, the, the information that is put into the comments that's public knowledge about soil health should be shared across all their groups, ir irrespective of their worldviews and whether or not they would get along together in a Zoom call. And so that's yeah. kind of how I've been thinking about like connecting data, you know, through these kind of common interests, networks and topics um, and, and allowing, um, you know, various levels of privacy for each resource, like a website or a project where it can kind of, you know, tra traverse across communities as well. Yeah. You, does anyone else have something to say before I keep flapping my, my mouth here? I just, about... I, I just want to make sure Lauren gets to uh, speak about the hash verse and hash bins because it's yeah. totally connected to all the matchmaking stuff. Uh, you can go, Sam, uh, if you want, but I think uh, I would also love to hear from Turquoise and just uh, more from the ladies in general. Yeah, sure. Lauren, maybe about the, the hash bins of memes that and resources. That's like a lot for right now. I can't. I, it, it's it's no, hard for me no. to just kind of jump into it. Quickie but, recap. No, but, it's just not but like what what is what is the hash verse? You, I don't even know what it is, and I've been talking with you every day. <laughs> oh, Lord. So, um, it's actually so. I think um, between Vincent and. Um, Pete, they're actually kind of building the technology to do what I want to do, but I think of it from a different non-technical perspective, which is the problem I'm trying to solve is that um, you have resources, and these resources I feel like are kind of like the soul and the talents of the people um, that we think we need money to use and so we don't think we have any resources if we don't have any money but there are lots of things that we can do um that don't we you know that um even if we don't have money we can we have these resources so what i'm trying to do is capture those uh resources um so that you can um raise massive amounts of uh, talent and kind of um, treasures by um, idea. And so it allows you, um, say if someone has like a hashtag, like an idea, like a little movement that they, they want to start, like Me Too or something like that, um, you can use hash bins to allow people to um, attach their talent or their resource to an idea and then have it be so that there it's like a it's like a bargain basement bin full of stuff that people have indicated that they would allow to use for this idea and then a third party can go in and actually um in actually arrange things and connect things and think of ideas to make kind of an innovation engine, um, people who might not normally not even have access to um, any re resources at all suddenly have a huge pot of resources to build stuff with, to make up any kind of crazy solution that they want. So it's like it would, it's 
basically a way to allow like immense creativity by freeing up either it's like IP um, or um, that say someone you know Disney might have uh, Mickey Mouse and they're like okay with this under this governance with this idea sure use Mickey Mouse we you know knock yourself out and um, so you suddenly can free up like tons of tons of IP and resources and stuff that are normally enclosed so it's basically like um, it, a hash bin is a way over this uh, enclosure that the, the current licensing doesn't really allow you to do. And that's, that's a really hash cool. verse, once you have hash bins, you can actually have almost like, um, you know, kind of blockchain data objects. You can have hash bins, have relationships with each other, and you can have a whole metaverse of fictitious entities that can kind of signal each other and create kind of like these um, whole neighborhoods of imaginary things. Mm -hmm, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. Oh, <laughs> it, it, it makes, me. you know, it makes, to I mean, it makes total sense. It's, that's how it works. That's how it works. That's how signal boundary networks work. What you just described in my humble opinion. So that's, I don't think you're just making something up. It's, um, you know, the other thing is you can, I can tell if you follow what Lauren's doing, she is listening to people and processing it and then modeling based off of that, which tends to really reflect how the information is flowing among people. And that's really, in my humble opinion, really valuable. Um, and, and maybe Tur I haven't really followed what Turquoise no. is doing, but I think she might be doing the same thing based off of how much Charles is raving about everything the yeah, that was actually <laughs> the perfect cue, Sam, because uh, that's exactly what we got into on, on Tuesday on Clubhouse. Turquoise. <laughs> All the kind of the voice uh, voice uh, stuff. I mean, and, and on and on, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm in two different worlds right now. So the voice stuff, and um, I guess I'll put a pen. So some of the stuff you were talking about maybe 30 minutes ago, I'm still kind of winding through Samuel about spread. And um, I have ideas around that, that you were going back with, back and forth with Peter. And I want to inquire around that, but I was in a listening mode to see if uh, you, you guys, how, how deep you went and if you touched on it. So I want to return to that at some point. Um, yes. So some of what we spoke um, in the room was about the ephemeral, the ephemeral nature of clubhouse and so these room types are being created and they're yielding different fruit different kind of collective intelligence debate dialogue dialectic all of these sorts of even presencing and mindfulness states and um, uh, at the end of that you know whatever has been created may feel may go into the collective unconscious or into the body or is kind of a felt sense but there's there's not a capturing mechanism and so the idea that I was um, talking about was like the intersection between maybe conversational AI and um, uh, speech to text and mind mapping so that uh, normal, or not normal, but like, uh, how do you get human? So if we're looking at the brain kind of idea, how do you make this a, a normalized sort of thing to uh, speak your ideas and then map them? And then how do we sense make and conceptualize so that they're interoperable? So if you have different mind maps, how do they talk to each other? How do they sense make together? What is the kind of structure of thought that is internally in, in an individual that can go, uh, that is, you know, cross paradigmatic and trans contextual as well. Um, and so this idea that maybe you could have, and, and Clubhouse was a use case of where maybe you're taking the audio and you're, and you're kind of taking that data um, and then uh, using some kind of conversational AI to parse through that data and then block it out in a, uh, you know, some kind of state, whether that's a mind map, whether that's a, a wiki, whether you're just, you know, taking it and putting it to text and then sense making or conceptualizing around that tense. Maybe you're able to block out the concepts and then add links, maybe search Google. Um, we talked about an app 
where you could, if you think of like artists and writers and they, in the past, I, I think I gave this situation of, uh, oh gosh, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Nicholas Cage has some movie where he's a writer. Anyways, he does this like note to self stuff, like back in the day when you would have a, an audit, you know, a little audio tape and you'd write, you talk about your ideas and so that you could speak into your phone and then maybe that app would give you a mind app and, or a mind map and allow you to, and suggest ideas that you would want to map from just listening to what you said. And then you could validate it or uh, add a link or something that makes this onboarding process much easier so that you don't have to be so data centric. And so like, you know, information dense and that it would be a, a, a process. I speak into my phone. It gives me these images of like, oh yeah, that, that was my concept check or, or maybe you change it. Maybe it didn't quite grok it. And then um, maybe over time that the, the AI would get, or the machine learning would um, improve and um, kind of uh, map itself to how you think a little bit better. And then you could maybe trade those and uh, with people or that you could kind of merge them together in some way. So that was uh, one idea of how do we actually, in, in the kind of wiki sense, we had been, had been talking with Jarek about how, um, so the, the, the kind of temporal and fractal nature of the mind isn't really captured in a wiki where it's flattened and there's like, this is truth. And then we'll argue in the comments about like our different ways of thinking, but that's not really that important. It's just kind of like where everybody like gets their steam out. And so that there may be version histories where people are battling, but it doesn't have this kind of like bifurcation where all the information and all the perspectives are captured. And so um, what is the value of, of having that? Uh, is the, and, and how do we create that um, so that we have this kind of multifaceted, uh, multi-narrative uh, complexity uh, that kind of weaves itself. Um, and that you could, you know, potentially look at some of these mind maps and maybe we privilege more over the others or maybe they have different use cases, lots of models and frameworks and how do we sense make around what kind of uh, large data that we, we get from these sort of collective intelligence in containers. Um, and, and that was kind of just what we were, uh, the kind of generative dialogue that we were having in that um, systems change thing. So Ooh. that's just kind of a little bit of a recap there. Yeah, that, you got me thinking there was a concept that I had been discussing privately with Lauren and Charles, and it comes from this guy named John Holland. And so John Holland was one of the people that was at University of Michigan, and he was one of the first people to create these complex systems models, you know, and he did it way back when they had like these vacuum tube computers. That's when he started doing that. And I, I met him when he was like 80 years old, and he had written his last book before he passed away and it was called signals and boundaries. And he was in that book, he was describing what he called signal boundary networks. And he was trying to say that this applies to everything anywhere that information is being processed. And what it boils down to is like, he was saying that the signal part of it is the, the signal part of it, the signal part of it is that is the rules that you're well you you might broadcast a signal and the way that I process process it will be the rules that I apply to it and the the boundary parts are the label or what he called the tag that I put on the information and a, a lot of the systems that we're talking about creating are pretty heavy on the tag part of it and we say like all right you know magic happens and then we put a label on the information <laughs> but the and, and the, the magic, the part of it that a lot of us have been missing is understanding if you have a, let's say you have 20 people that use this or a thousand, each person is processing the information with rules in their mind. And it's hard to uncover the rules that they're applying to that. And that's like the missing piece of what, of how, of what we're doing here that we all struggle to think, how could we get, and like when, when Claire W. Graves, the guy that came up with Spiral Dynamics, he just went and asked people like, all right, what do you think this is? Just tell me, you know? And then people would say, well, I think, well, he would ask him a question like, what do you think a mature human being adult is in your own words? Just tell me what you think it is. And they would, people would tell him this. Then he would take all of that information that people gave him and he handed it over to one of his peers and he said, just quantify this any way you can. 
you know, whatever you think is the quantification and qualification of this. And he did that over and over again. And it turned out to be like a human being based clustering algorithm computer outcome. Um, and then from there, he looked for the patterns that people kept saying, well, I think these people are doing this and I think these people are doing that. And anyway, that, that was a way that one effective way to draw out the rules that people are applying to the signals that are coming at them and that that could enhance the, the labels that we put on it or the taxonomy or the whatever it is that we're putting. Once we understand more about the, that, and maybe people could tell us somehow in when it comes, whether it's that you actually got a bunch of people together and just got them talking about how they process this information um, or what they think about the topics at hand, or maybe they could do it asynchronously. Maybe you can do it synchronously where you talk about things or maybe there's a better fit where it's asynchronous, where you actually could just, like you said, with like a wiki, you can put it. This is what we used to do in wiki communities to try to understand each other's rule process, processing of the signals. We would do exactly what you said. We'd make a page and say like, this page is about uh, network collaboration. And then we would say, then we would just sit there and talk about like, well, this is what I think about network collaboration. This is what I think. And then we would harvest the pieces that we thought were valuable together and make it part of the top page of that wiki page. And that would might take months and months of blathering and talking in that <laughs> wiki and then finally doing that. And there's probably a better way to do it than that, I would bet for most people. Um, but in the end, it, I feel like that's the part that's from everything that we've all talked about. I feel like everything will work that everyone wants to do. But the, the last piece is to figure out how each person is processing these signals that are coming at them and, and, and then, and that you could then, whether it's algorithmic outcomes or human guided outcomes that you can guide them toward understand the sense making and understanding of that, in, that knowledge or information or whatever you want to call it data, whatever it is. Um, anyway, sorry. I just, I just thought I would, would, that's where I, I don't know if that helps Lauren. then all these times I talked about this signal boundary stuff and, whatever it's the the piece of the puzzle that everyone seems to be getting close to but not getting yet is understanding how how every individual is processing this information even when you have sessions where you where you get closer because you get a shared understanding but that everyone still walks away and they have their own individual understanding still and rules that they're applying so you can get closer and closer, but you'll never really get into it unless someone is really explicit about how they're doing. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. I just this... want to say um, the methodology you described for the mature human sounds somewhat like our uh, methodology that we're using for our group intelligence um, story methodology. Very similar. Yeah, that's I mean, it's a very similar, you know, that I don't even know how he came up with that, but he said that he was teaching that in his classes. He was teaching um, the latest psych psycho psychology theories of the day, and his students kept raising their hand and saying, like, this doesn't sound right. You know, what about this? What about that? And he said, you know, you're right. This is all garbage. Let's start. Let's just try to come up. <laughs> let's start over again, basically, and see if we can figure out what's really happening here. And that's where he took that. But it really, it's a sense-making methodology. The other thing is that he tried to, to articulate that you'll never come up with this complete model ever. You'll never come up with a complete model because it's in a dynamic evolving system. So if you want to have a model of psychology or whatever it is, it's never, it's, you might as well just know and assume it'll never be complete instead of trying to perfect this model and say, if we just did this extra little bit of research, we'd have this complete model of human psychology. And instead you, 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 you'll always have to keep changing and and adapting and forking and branching the model the forking the mat the brand you'll have to keep branching and merging all of the models of all of the things that human beings are involved in period um as as a bookmark um there's a, a guy who's in free jerry's brain uh mark antoine parent parent um uh he has the I, he he believes he has the data structure for this um uh, claims and counterclaims and uh, event streams and hypergraphs and hyper hypergraphs or something like that. It's it's all above my pay grade um, because it, it gets into like graph science and graph theory and, and it's above graph. all of our pay grades. Well, but on the other hand, 
Um, <laughs> maybe not above turquoises, but but <laughs> I think he's got the the data structure for that, and um, and maybe maybe there's hope that we can actually do all this stuff you know uh, branching complexity and changing uh changing stuff and all that he's he's like oh yeah i can i can uh i can represent that in in my data format so yeah one thing that has i've been speaking on is is um so the coarse nature of language and pr there's i feel like there should or could be a potential for inside of what we're calling these kind of sovereigns or there's these guilds that there can be um a shared language that it's that it's that is agreed upon um and and how so i've been calling it like four dimensional language or uh you know uh, conversational jazz fractal dialogues and i'll give an example um so on the issue of complex collaboration if we're thinking of a uh, kind of language as as linear um, it does have this fractal nature where it bifurcates and, you know, with nouns and those sorts of things, but actual, not only an X, but a Y dimension. And this Y dimension is greater levels of complexity. So instead of uh, synonyms that are all interchangeable and that we can all use the same thing to mean a slightly different thing, that we're actually uh, drilling down into the granularity. So an example of a stack for uh, for complex collaboration might be something where you start with the term coordination, and that's just a low level. We have the same knowledge. We're, make, we're choosing to um, uh, make, a decision, make a decision synchronistically. Um, and then up from that, and, and maybe these are these complex layers of complexity are, are um, informed by trust. So the deeper trust you have with an organization or individuals, you maybe move up from that and that's cooperation. It's joint operation or an action. And maybe up from that is collaboration. It's synergistic, it's long-term, it has higher levels of trust. Um, and maybe up from that would be something like a, a co-creation or something. And so uh, the deeper and deeper you go, like the deep profiles kind of like the deeper, the more you know, uh, it can kind of spiral up in, in complexity. And maybe the arc of that is something like co-action. Um, and so that you can use these types of ways of speaking, or you can agree upon some kind of language so that we have a like a precise, a granular understanding so that when we have these um, kind of wisdom pods that are embedded or these uh, guilds that are embedded within larger systems, they are there's a specificity to which uh, they intend to speak. And that also informs how the actual system is moving, right? So you may have a an NGO that is just doing coordination, but they're doing collaboration, but they're doing cooperation. And it's speaking to the density and the complexity with which these, um, these um, relationships are happening. And so that's just one way of looking at like stacked language um, in greater levels of complexity, rather than using synonyms that were kind of a, a little fuzzy and were kind of just inserting and it doesn't have to be that way. You can agree upon that. Um, and maybe the linguistics don't need to be that technical, but that you can flatten those ideas and those concepts into uh, pictograms or ideograms or hieroglyphs so that you can just have an image to, to speak to a level of complexity. So it's not that everybody needs to know, ah, uh, you know, uh, co-creation co or Kobe is, is lower than co-becoming and it's in this arc of, of uh, co-action, uh, but that there is this understanding that we're speaking in systems language using intentional intentionality and that we can reduce some of that complexity into images that are flattening and embedding that. So that's just one, uh, yeah, Charles. Just super quick because um, um, new, new buddy of ours, new, new kid in the systems innovators block, uh, Trudy Miller, I'm just getting in touch with her and we're about to talk maybe later today. And she was talking all about that stuff. So I just want to mention that. I love Judy. She has the purple and blue um, image, right? Yeah. So any of these models that might be applicable in these ways so that, that you can say a thing quickly in the same way that like 
Um, our linguistics often inform our worldview. So I can hear people use terms and I know that they've read the book, whether it's uh, in to transcend and include or warm dad or whatever Bucky sort of uh, language, I'm, I'm being informed about your worldview and that we'll map to one another and I'll find resonance in that. That's one level of, 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 of kind of um, that interpersonal develop or uh, interpersonal di dimension, um, but that there can be ways to kind of agree or um, in the same way that you would have a um, a band that you play with regularly and maybe this is a jazz band and they know the charts and they know the modes and they know the chords and so I know that you riff on this thing and I can intuit that you're going to riff on this thing and when you do I can add on to it and so there's this like actual jazz nature to conversations and not on the like colloquial conversational jazz we are not all jazz artists but that we can become jazz artists some of us are learning do re mi and and you know learning learning the scales and other of us are at higher and higher levels of this um you know miles davises and coltrane's and that when you get in a group with people that you can create this coherence and this regularity of jamming and and playing this really high level um uh, both being and doing and designing and creating an emerging thing that's happening. Um, and so I, I, that's just kind of a, a fuzzy way of, of saying, hey, I th there's a language thing that's here that, that, um, that, that, you know, um, could be cleaned up or could be worked with or could be molded in a way that I haven't seen done yet. Um, and that, there are these jazz artists or these conversational uh, jazz artists um, could be well versed in many different container types and whether that's uh, like liberating structures or whether that's a co-design or whether that's you know dialogue dialectic debate all of those sorts of things um, dyads slow talks tea talks mm -hmm. um, that once you once you've had that experience and when you can hold that presence and when you can do that thing that you can shift really quickly um down regulating your nervous system slowing down your breath stopping to integrate whatever complex idea somebody had and that you can use these different rules and boundary sets to kind of guide um development uh, so mm -hmm. i'll stop there no i i i really appreciate what you're saying you got you got me thinking one thing a long time ago, when I first started doing all this work in communities, I used to go and sit down in front of people and kind of tell them what I thought. And that one of the people that was part of the project that I was on, he was a social anthropologist and he spent, you know, I don't know how much, he's like 20,000 hours of listening to the people talk and studying it as a social anthropologist. And he took me aside and he was like, Sam, he was like, you're just like, he's like, you're way too complicated everything you're saying is way out here and most people you're talking to are way back here basically and he's he showed me a couple of these videos that he found where somebody was explaining something like google docs or whatever and they were using metaphors and they were basically saying like you know this is your garage and you put stuff in your garage and they were using that to explain google docs and he was like this is what you need to do when you're talking to people about this and he was like, he challenged me to try to think of like three or five concepts that I could map everything to. And I started doing that, but also the concepts have to be metaphors that they understand, like a house or a car or whatever. This is probably exactly what you're talking about. So, you know, I'm not trying to mansplain it back to you, but I'm no, just sharing, share, I'm just sharing my experience with you. Um, and, but the one thing then all that I was also going to say was in all these wiki communities that I was part of probably the most effective thing that I feel like emerged from those and it became kind of unexplored and maybe now people are exploring this more was we would do that through like an inquiry. We would say like, we have this question we want to answer and most people understand an inquiry and a question. And they, and so just the question mark alone is like, this is a question. And then they, then you can be, they'll, they're ready to understand. Like maybe I don't even understand what this question is asking, but I'll open my mind to it because I know what a question is like, it doesn't really matter who you are. They could, you can map your understanding to the fact that someone's trying to ask a question. Then you could talk turquoise. You could talk about all that stuff that people would might be just be like their eyes might glaze over with those concepts. But you can be like, look, this is how this relates to this question, and this is the emerging answer. 
you know, and you could, one of the things that we did in, in, in those wiki communities, was we did this like organized network inquiry. And way back then we were trying to, before Bitcoin emerged, we were trying to find the answer for how I could send you money without going through the existing banking system. And there wasn't really something that existed at that time. So I led this organized network inquiry and I asked this question across like 20 email lists, wiki communities and all this shit. And I, sp I, I strewed this question across wiki co uh, uh, communities, but then I brought it all back to like one page and brought back kind of, this is pretty much what Lauren is doing when she's wrapping the Kiko lab discussions, but this wasn't like a real time discussion. It was just posted asynchronously and people answered it. And I think people were more used to communicating that way then because you couldn't really, there weren't many platforms that you could do what we're doing now at that time. Um, but, the, but I found it really effective to just have, if I made a really simple question and keep mapping all of the, of the information back to that. And then, and then people, when they answer, I could, you know, at that, I'm facilitating this, which is different than what you're talking about. But I'm saying like, oh, when you say this, I think you mean this. And we kind of have that little discussion, but keep pushing it back to that um, question. So basically organized network inquiry seems to be one of the ways to kind of like bring more and more people into do what you're trying to do. I love that. Um, so this is kind of pairing with the question I had earlier too. Let's see where you guys, <laughs> um, so two way, two way information. So like I gave this example of co-action and this kind of spiraling up of complexity using language, but the, the idea is to accordion this and collapse it into images and then push it out through a mimetic funnel or a meme cannon. And this is, speaks to like Peter's idea of chunking information. And as you chunk this information, uh, if we're thinking about the mar march of the memes, like the meme plexes, the mimetic um, uh, worldviews, you can take this high level complexity, all of this abstraction, and chunk it out and reduce it and and you know it gets more granular but you can push it down a funnel uh, of information and you can disperse this information and this is kind of to how do we okay you've got all these systems designers and they're in their you know their little clusters but like how do you get this to real people who are interested and so mm -hmm. like you reduce the complexity and push that out and so what i'm hearing from you is like the inquiry can pull this information back, you know, so it's a two-way system of not only a, a mimetic funnel being as literal as memes, meme canon, images, uh, information, some kind of both images, comedy, and um, maybe even data visualization or infographics. So like those four types of flattening of infra images, like an infographic is like a really cool way to show this thing or data visualization, but you also need the comedy and you need the like consumption aspect of, of online data. Like this needs to be funny and, and you know, it has to be part of the zeitgeist and it, you know, maybe we can throw yeah. it down Facebook sort of thing. And there are different levels of doing that. Maybe yeah. you put some rap music on it, you know, maybe you it's put like, whatever it is so that yeah, there's you, this, you like, could You could send I'm, that I'm to eating, me. I'm eating broccoli with cheese on top of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you you can send that to me or you could send me like a spreadsheet and which would i rather receive right yes so exactly, send me exactly. <laughs> which How one do of those I two it to my children <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Um, and so this two way of like asking the inquiry and getting the involvement and the um the thinking into the the ideating around and the kind of like being with a, a question that i may not understand but participating in it nonetheless and then i'm also digesting maybe things that come down the pike. I, I'm thinking there, there's an infographic about conspiracy theory and it's just a funnel about like normal level conspiracies that happen as you go, it gets crazier and crazier. And that was shared because of, you know, the information ecosphere, the misinformation, the disinformation. 10 years ago, yeah. when I was looking into conspiracy or 15, gosh, uh, for my thesis, nobody was talking about Alex Jones. And I was looking into all of that stuff, you know, and now it was like widely spread on Facebook and Twitter and all. I'm like, oh, look at all these people interested in all these conspiracy theories. Well, that's so, the um, Right? What? Uh, they, they, Howard Rheingold called it craft detection after Ernest Hemingway, but that's, you know, going back. <laughs> yeah, so these are all parts of like this guy and mine connectome spec uh, uh, that I've been writing of, of like, oh, we need this conversational jazz thing. We need these, you know, class types. We need these mimetic funnels. We need, and, and so these are just kind of like 
ideas that are metaphors and analogies that are kind of loosely saying, hey, information should be doing this thing. Some people should be doing these things. Here's a geometry or a topology or a shape that we can think about how to interconnect wisdom pods or, or guilds or whatever. And, and that people can kind of into it, into it with a, into it, into it <laughs> without, <laughs> uh, without being too technical. Uh, they don't have to know about peer to peer, hollow chain, blockchain, da, 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 so on and so forth. But they can kind of, oh, the connectome is this part of the brain or, oh, I know what bees do. They pollinate. They like yeah. fly around up here, you know, sort of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, this is exactly what I was kind of blathering about. I think you're right on. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you, you riff really well. Your yeah. Thank you. <laughs> what, one of the things like, you know, when I, I learned from these complex system scientists, when they make complex systems models that are like agent based models that are actually predictive of the real world, they figure out how to draw the right boundary around everything. So they don't try to simulate the entire universe. They can't do it. But so they figure out like, all right, you know, what am I going to out of the entire universe? What am I going to choose to model? And then when they run it, they can actually see like, ooh, this actually kind of predicts that this could happen, you know? When if they get that right, and that's kind of what you're talking about doing is like somehow I got to let for the different people I'm working with, I got to try to figure out how to draw a boundary. Yeah, the pem, uh, the the semi permeable and permeable membranes, and what do they look like, and what does osmosis and and information synthesis kind of look like, and and what are the boundaries? So if we're talking yeah. about a cluster that has a core that is quite stable, like how do people come in and shift and participate, and what does the geometry look like when they do? You know, if you've got the, uh, the pillars of a, of a cluster or a guild or a wisdom pod or a wisdom circle Four. what does it look like with five and how do those people shift? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and, and like, that is a very relational sort of thing that happens and how does data inform that and information or a technology actually support that rather than, uh, you, you know, uh, have schismogenesis, like breaking and fracturing aspects to it. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, how does it not, how does it, you know, um, how does it support that and kind of uh, nurture, you know, five going to the six to it? You know, it reminds me of um, Metatron's cubes and, and the sort of flower life stuff. Like, how do we do that thing um, the, seamlessly? The, the, the other thing that that it gets, I communicated this a couple of days ago privately to Lauren and Charles that a lot of us in the Western world have this paradigm where if we want to do something, we have to kind of change the environment and make it do what we want it to do in order to like know that that's like that's the security that we give ourselves like all right if i want to grow crops i need to clear this entire field plow it down plant just the one crop in put chemicals on it throughout the year and then i'm now i know or at least pretty close to knowing that that's going to do what i thought i wanted it to do and, and we actually apply that to all the rest of these systems many times too, is like, we just got to clear cut and completely terraform and change it into whatever was in our mind and whatever we think will work in that approach. And I was giving them examples about how like in the area that I'm in in Michigan, that there wasn't originally like bison here and the indigenous people use fire and all these other approaches over decades. And they drew them into the area that I'm in now for a while by changing the landscape but they just did like little changes and they kept observing and observing and it would change. Like you're saying, mm -hmm. like they didn't know exactly what was going to happen when they did these changes. So then they wait and see, and then they do another change. And then, and they also did the same thing with wild rice in like, if you went into the, the um, wetland areas, it wasn't chock full of wild rice, but over like decades and centuries, they figured out just changing things. They could actually get the amount of wild rice that you would have gotten through monoculture pretty close to that amount but they just would paddle through these areas and do and pull out small plants or just that they had to keep, they had to keep changing and observing and changing and observing over and over and over again. And then they transform the entire landscape that way. But most of the rest of it was done by the rest of what was in the ecology. They didn't, they didn't have to go and dredge the entire yeah. um, thing. And so what you're talking about, it's hard for people to do because it's like, they're like, well, wait a minute, where's the part where I completely plow this whole thing <laughs> under and, and destroy it all and then make the thing that I want to make when it's all gone? When does that happen? And you're like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Like, you're not, 
that's not what you're saying. Yeah, so. that's interesting. Iterative experience or iter experiments working with the complexity versus this kind of tabula rasa that's intended to reduce the complexity, right? But what it introduces, like if we're talking about glyphosate or what whatever, it like explodes the complexity because you're kind of you know, unintentionally breaking the system at some point, yeah. you know, you're, you're actually uh, not acknowledging the interconnectivity of nature and your role inside of it. Right. Yeah. You're kind yeah. of like dominating it in a sense and hoping that the blowback doesn't hit you too hard. But, but it's, the same, the line. it's the same thing that you're saying with like, let's make an ontology that we can either plow the whole field under and make the ontology. I'm going to tell you what these things mean and you'll listen to me. Or it could be like, <laughs> you do it in the other way that we're talking about and say like, you know what I mean? Like organic you, there, you want to, you want to try to steer the system to a degree in a direction that you think would be that you and ever, others you're working with agree would be better, but, but you're going to let the whole, the system be a big factor in it. And you start to understand by doing small changes, how you steer it. And, the, yeah. and, and I, yeah, anyway, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just thinking of the, the, the localization or, um, uh, has a flavor to it right so like and and benjamin has been talking about this is like uh, almost like a cosmopolitan localism um each little group is going to have its own flavor right like its flavor profile and you can't even account for the ontological complexity of local flavor of and we can call that cultural we can call that whatever we're, we're calling but like uh even if we got the greatest minds, a thousand of the greatest minds to plot everybody's ontologies, we wouldn't be able to do it because it's emergent, right? It's emergent, not only in the local, but also in the time scale, uh, because language is constantly evolving and changing in meaning yeah. and experiences, and you can never flatten that state and then preserve it uh, you know, in, you know, for, for eternity. It's like this hyper yeah. object, right? Yeah, but that, that's like one of the core things that you would have to walk people over for them to participate in the kinds of things that you want to do. Like they actually would have to realize like, Oh wait, it's okay. If every time we map this, it, the model changes or yes. like it's not the same as the other one. That's Verb. part of this. You could expect that to happen from the, the beginning of this. And that's actually, we want that. You're going to be able to do more, solve more problems. Every, everything you could promise them all these things like a commercial, like it's going to be better and faster and, you know, you know, more improved if you actually are cool with that, because every most people are coming from the paradigm that a lot of us came from, where it's it's this industrial Western paradigm of like in order to solve problems, you got you have to take control of everything, raise it to the ground and rebuild it in order to make it work. And it's an unspoken thing. And it's that's the rules that people are processing reality through. And then you'll end up having the, this. It'll be harder and harder to get those people engaged with you. But if they yeah. understand from the beginning, like, no, it's OK. This can be like how jazz music is like there's some order and structure and there's some free wandering. And that's what that's exactly how this is going to end up being. You should you should be not surprised by that. And that's the outcome we want. And like if you're mapping people to this, that's where I'm, I'm these days. I've been trying to help f figure out how to get. Some people are ready for that now, you know what I mean? And they can see that what they're doing isn't working. And I'm trying to actually get in the real world and bring people over and help them understand how to do something with that insight. And But then what they would do would be the stuff that you're talking about. <laughs> Everything yeah. that you're saying is the, yeah. is the thing that they would do. Um, you know, once Real quick, I want to I want to double click on something you said, and Benjamin speaks to this, this often, like understanding yourself as a verb. So I just want to tease this part out because this worldview is like actually critical to the foundational understanding. So like, if we, I have a you know a perception, a projection of who you all are. It's a character. It's a slice in time, and I flatten you, but I understand you as a multi-dimensional baby, birth to death being, right? That that uh, develop you know in spiral dynamics, integral theory, we move and we change. But not everybody has that, right? Like in every given moment, we we can uh, identify as a, a certain thing and that we're flattened in our dimensionality in that one moment and that you're that and you don't change and we can judge you by that, right? And so this understanding that we are um, moving, changing dynamic verbs as beings and understanding that in an embodied sense so that we act from that place is like fundamental core nature, like this temporal dimension. People 
people intuit it. Oh yeah, yeah, you grow and you age. But then when they judge people, they slice them in time. They don't, they don't remember that they're going somewhere and they're coming from somebody and they're informed by all of that experience. And that that is what informs the compassion and the, and the willingness to kind of do this higher level, have this higher order thing. And I, I find fundamentally, even when we're talking about, um, I think we were talking about white supremacy earlier, the idea of a racist or someone who it, it, you know, enacts racist action or bias that ends in racist outcomes, right? Like that, that a racist may not, all, a racist may not always be a racist, but in this moment, you're flattening their action and, and kind of, you know, um, and that, ra that those ideologies come from a place and go to and can move to a place, right? And so all of those sorts of things, um, what's coming up for me right now is the mean green meme <laughs> and, and, and the rejection of, of, of some of those uh, dynamics that people, people are verbs and they change. Uh, and, and not only are people individuals verbs but you know uh, families and communities and um you know states and provinces and nation states and so that that under that moving thing if there's ways to kind of um have everybody get that in a big sense um and so that it informs their uh their, how they relate with one another. So it's not just the, oh yeah, I understand that people change and grow. It's that it actually informs my way of being constantly. Like I'm actually giving you the grace and the, and the like the liberty and the, and the space to develop into the beautiful divine being, even knowing that sometimes you may fail or you may you know mess up or you may hurt me or whatever it is, but that that component right there, um, that e emotional intelligence, that spiritual intelligence, I would put it in the, it's both a emotional intelligence, a systemic intelligence or metasystemic, and then this kind of spiritual intelligence, transcendent intelligence that kind of, uh, that I, that is need from systems people, but also all the way through to NGOs and, and all, you know, nonprofits. And is that, is that understanding? Mm -hmm, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to find people in all those spaces that it's a mixed bag, but there's people that realize like whatever we were doing isn't working and they're starting to listen to something like what, if you were there talking to them and they'd be like, yeah, this is exactly what I was thinking in my mind, like what you're saying and, but they don't know how to approach it. And everyone else that they're working with is doing all this stuff the other way, you know? And, and so th there's, so there's, yeah, go ahead. Now I think you're too quiet, Sam, for what it's worth. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, I have to uh, drop off, I have to drop yeah, off. I, I'm really sorry about how, that. How fast do you need to drop off right now or in two minutes? In like five minutes, maybe. Or so. uh, let's let's land this this plane. Um, and when can we take off again <laughs> uh, and where? <laughs> uh, is this is this group flotilla? Is it a, a different guild? Um, it's a mashup. Is, I mean, this is it. It's a, is it a group of groups know, still? Where, where can we all chat car. together? <laughs> Where can we do chat together at least? Um, we do have um, uh, Pete. If you if you're willing to use Telegram more, a lot of us do use Telegram in this. We 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 made a, um, a linked Open Wisdom Commons Kiko Lab channel, so that is one place where many of us are already. Oh. Um, that comes to mind, and or we got to Mattermost. Um, I think Lauren's less frequently on Mattermost, if I understand. Lauren and I use Telegram a lot, and and Sam as well. So, okay, let's meet in Telegram. Cool. I'll um. Yeah. And, I'll and, find uh, yeah. By the way, Benjamin's so, so that's dancing. A, that's in a bigger group. Rudy! 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> we were just talking about you. Um, Benjamin's audience. dancing in his room and says that it's been awesome. I just wanted to highlight from that from the chat. So. I, um, so linked open wisdom commons is is 115 people so i think that's a big no 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 this is a this is a, a sub this is just the it's very you mean small. the back channel from that yeah there, there's okay. a back channel yeah i think it's okay. five of us or something okay yeah um oh trudy was oh there's trudy okay hi <laughs> Yeah, Trudy. Welcome. Right on time. We're, we're hello, sort of hello. Winding out, but um, I'm I, literally. I, I have to say, my eyes are barely open. I'm so tired. I need a nap. <laughs> but I was like, oh my god, everybody's there. I have to say at least hello. 
Yeah, this is really cool. And um, I'll circle back with you a little later. It's been back to back. So I, I have messages from you to catch up on. But I just it just occurred to me like, oh, I should at least let you know. And um, glad I did. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm here. I don't know what it is. I actually think it's partly, you know, I'm just accepting that this is how it works. Of course, the Zoom didn't work on my phone. I always have like four or five relays in order to get something going, which is why I'm so overwhelmed with the tech now and the clubhouse and the whatever. It's just like my shit always takes like two or three times before I can get it to work. And that's that's my thing. I'm a computer programmer and I have the same problem. Yeah, so that's everybody's so, thing. Oh, okay. So you know, if it makes you feel any better. I have, sometimes I have to come into Zoom like three times to get the video wow. and audio. Wow, okay, okay. It's terrible. I've got tech specs and, and coding skills, and it's still, I was having trouble yeah. getting on this, this one. Yeah, I was just like, okay, I guess this is the thing that keeps me humble. You know, we all need something, right? I cannot walk and chew gum. Fine. <laughs> no, you're on the same level as all of us, though. Actually, you have to find something else to keep you humble. Right. Oh, the, the tech is, is my humbling situation. <laughs> so what were you so guys I just, talking about? I just put, so just make sure everybody gets this link that I just dropped in, which is uh, Telegram. And to Sam, thanks for being here and hanging. And that was just wonderful. I know you have to cut out. Um, oh, sure. Just to, you, Sam. Yeah, nice to be yeah. here. So Trudy, you're just going to see Sam on his way out here, and um, so we'll all we'll. we'll I, I'm out going there. to. I'm going to be wrapping too. So yeah, I think we're all kind of wrapping um, shortly. But um, so that that's a Telegram group that's it's quite small, just for us to here to huddle. We can rename it as we like, but um, let's just go there at least. So and then T we can... dot me, correct? That's the very last. Yeah. Lesson. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, I'll put this in the telegram, but there's also some notes, which are mostly just words, but. <clears throat> so this is the oh, cool. LOC Kiko Labs telegram. That's the link. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm already in that. I'm just was wondering if. Cool. I yeah, that's what I figured. Many of us are already. And then, yeah. And, and I saw um, Peter just um, joined. So cool. So I have a, a few more minutes, but I don't know who needs to go and who needs to just shut this whole thing down. It's fine. We've been cruising for a long time, but, and Trudy, like I said, I'll, I'll come to you in a, in a while. Um, but, um, and Lauren, you're, you're off camera, but if, if you're, uh, yeah, I'm around, I'm just indisposed. Okay, I sent no you an, a LinkedIn invite. Let's be friends forever. Hey. <laughs> no, it's on. I mean, this is it. We're, we're, we're you know, you not, no one's getting. I sent out you one too, Peter, but that was before the group. Okay, and so, so Peter, what thing. is this link? Of course, you know, I've never been in Telegram either. I have, like, you know, I don't. Have, what's so, the? So, so Trudy, I'll explain. Um, I don't, I don't everything. want to take the time with you so, guys as a group to what, do this. I'll do my so, homework, but. So uh, look, I, Trudy, I would just um, first of all call everybody's attention to this like amazing uh, panorama, and I will just ask Trudy in in one or two minutes, maybe. Um, also, Sam, Sam, if you have one or two minutes more, yep. just to hear a little bit about this um, visual. Um... Sorry, I muted. The model, myself. the model. Uh, the model okay. thing that the we 20 year model so, <laughs> i know my god you know maybe just a smidgen f okay. as a hint before we shut it down absolutely um so i studied sustainable design um particularly concentrating on design for developing countries so i very early on started developing a strategy like a product development strategy that was about lo-fi product development that was like hyper-functional. So I've done that. So I was creating a lot of case studies while I was kind of more of an architect designer educator in that regard, as well as teaching curriculum around it. And um, so I weaving through all sorts of things, um, it, it within the last, I would say four years, it turned more into a personal development tool, if you will, because you know, it got really hectic in 2016. And I was like, I am not matching my product vision. How do I actually, like in these circumstances as a person, I'm not matching my own vision. And so how do I become more, even more generous of spirit 
in the way that I handle these next four years, you know? And so it, it, it then became much more about how does this tool help me self-regulate? How does this tool help me be more empathic? How does this tool translate into business models? How does it translate into you know, community building or team building. And so essentially it's, the, it's, a, it's a sequence of events and a sequence of maps that take you through whatever the process is. And, um, you know, to, to get the outcome of what I've been color coding, but it doesn't have to be with colors. It could just be left, right and center. But for the purposes of, you know, attracting kids attention and getting it such that it's not about being able to read or not. I thought the colors and the animal symbols were a good place to start. And all of them have tie into like a spatial relations map or spatial relations game based on whatever is happening. So whether it's a conflict resolution situation, whether it's a product development situation, whether it's a lifestyle design option or a product design option. And so they kind of, all reinforce each other. So that way the, the meta data is kind of always either in the background or forefront, depending on, you know, what you're thinking about. And so, so yeah, that's a little bit of the background. And the idea is that this tool had to be intergenerational because I was, I was literally just bored to death in like, I don't know, 2011. I was like, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm done <laughs> for like as long as I'm, and it's been like about 10 years where I'm on like a low, low intake mode because I'm like, I have to do this thing and I actually have to make it kid friendly because nobody's gonna believe that this thing is a thing unless kids know how to do it. And kids are gonna let you know if it doesn't work as well. And so that's kind of where I've been focused and I've just been running around um, all of last year, doing lots of trainings with different types of audiences, getting a sense of what they want built around it similarly to how I developed my clothing line I I had a store and women would come in and be like well what can you do about this stuff or you know and I would develop clothes around just like an architect would develop clothes around their needs that were also flexible frameworks that people could use in other ways and so just getting people equipped to do that for themselves is what I'm primarily interested in Wow. That's Thank incredible. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for I, just the magic. I don't know if it was Turquoise or Elliot who was in your room, whoever I followed to your room. I'm super happy about it. And the good news is, is that the reason why I'm such a quiet addict is that the minute I don't, I don't ca calendar anything. It's like, oh, that's it. Oh, that's it. Whether I'm inside, outside, wherever, it's always, oh, that's it. And it's been like that for the last a yeah, last year at least, but the last month on Clubhouse, it's like, okay, okay, that's it, you know? And um, so that's- Some of us call that the flow, you know? <laughs> yeah, literally. I'm, and I was like, am I just addicted to the flow state? I know I have to get this information out, you know? <laughs> so Clubhouse was kind of a crash landing into like talking to people and sharing about it in a non-classroom context, you know? Um, so, and, you know, I'm just so excited to see <laughs> flow is a good thing to be addicted to. <laughs> Thanks, Vincent. So, so yeah, that's really been it. And I, so I've been in Clubhouse just heat seeking for solutionistas who talk this kind of talk. Like they don't have the, they don't get it. They don't have the tools yet, but they're likely to be able to understand and interpret it in ways that are beyond my scope. I want a sports expert to be doing the same thing for around performance. So I'm looking for people who would be interested in learning how to speak this little language as, and translate it into as many ways as possible. And I'm super personally super interested in doing it in a music format um, because yeah. it, we're, I'm from Jamaica and we use music as a communication tool. We do rhythms, versions of a thing. So the idea here would be that I'm the DJ with the track and I want everybody to make their own version of it. Oh, uh, yeah. 
so <laughs> that's that's kind of where that's my personal yes the sdgs and the blah 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 but in terms of what i want to be doing that's what i want to be doing well that's literally my language too so thank you <laughs> oh awesome and i think it's turquoises as well it's yeah, yeah. with rhythm Yes, so that's you know yeah, the, the code cracker rhythm. That's what I've been called. But rhythm. I mean, what we what we I do. I am Trinidadian, first generation oh, yeah. Trinidadian, so oh, wow. lots of rhythm. <laughs> okay. in my family. So we just call it the flow show. It's we 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 do the flow show and awesome. uh, spin it up, you know. Truly, is is your like work and and things you're doing? Uh, is there a way to see it online somewhere or not? Quite that yet. I'm still working on. Mm -hmm. I literally, oh, let me sorry. tell you, actually, I'll give you a story. They're on the map, let's say one of these maps where, where I'm using creatures. This is a top row before you get to do anything. I am playing possum on social media. Like, look, I'm, I'm like playing dead and building in stealth. So nothing, nothing is really anywhere. I can send links to people, but it's not on my website. I only, um, put a few things out when I was recruiting people last year and pretty much it's all been on Crowdcast or, you know, Zoom and stuff like that. And I just have not updated the website because I haven't had, I don't want it to be just me. You know what I mean? It's like, I need to find the right people and I need to have it be clear that this is a tool, not just for me, but a tool that people use in different ways. So this is why I've been concentrating mostly on training and getting people who have a sense of it to you know, do their piece and then like putting that together. So I'm, I'm still editing. I did a 16 week training at like a beginning and an advanced one, um, one in the fall, one in the spring. And there's tons of video and tons of stuff that still needs editing that I'm just like, I have to sit and watch myself for God knows how many hours. How is this going to get done? You know, um, but it's, um, yeah. It's, Lauren knows like, about that. Pardon? Sorry, Lauren knows all about that. She's the video queen here as well. Oh, wow, wow. Massive wiki already has... Static. Okay. This is a, a Judy. There's, I'm, I'm working on a project called Massive Wiki where lots of people can work on something, and then, and then actually, whenever somebody of course saves you changes, are. <laughs> whenever somebody saves changes to it, it 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 copies the wiki onto a website. Oh my goodness! This is see, this is what I'm talking about. Like I have no depth for how this thing needs to happen. I just, and these are the people I need to be talking to about, okay, well, how can I begin sharing? Cause I've been doing everything in Notion, which um, I think is great, but it has some like real problems, you know, like um, if you're copying a spreadsheet, you're missing the first line of data. That's bad, <laughs> right? So I don't want to land somewhere. I don't want to land this spacecraft in a place that's like not, not conducive to to growth or continuity you know it's good for certain things i love it because i get to use the colors in there combined with excel but um but beyond that it has some serious limitations i love it for the for the you know just packaging stuff but apart from that it's kind of challenging um, massive wiki is is not as good as notion in a lot of ways but it's much better for interoperability and for sharing so did you drop the link or something um it's it's actually it's so new that it's hard to use um okay uh so you you, you basically have to <laughs> have a master like me show you how to use it but then after that i swear it's super easy to use <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just in all right it's it just it's about pete's calibre right <laughs> yeah you know, one of, one of the first things we were talking about earlier was whether Peter had experience with just non-technical people using Massive Wiki. Uh -huh. and this is where we ended up. That's where we kind of started. And now you're maybe looking at using it. So non-technical people can use it. And, and even it deploys automatically to Netlify, which is just amazing. Oh. But, but, you, <laughs> but to get so that you can be a non-technical person using it, you actually need at least half an hour with Pete to kind of get you over a hump. That's, that's awesome. I mean, and that's the whole thing because the idea with this whole setup is that there's always a guide to onboard you, 
to onboard you, right? And a lot of what I've been developing is like, okay, some people um, prefer or hear things better just in an auditory format, which is why I'm also liking the clubhouse thing. Some people need the visual, some people need whatever. So like the, the idea that there's this period where you're going to kind of get into this new atmosphere, like a new atmospheric pressure, you know, like, okay, we're seriously traveling here. This is what you need. That's how I've been introducing it as a game for kids, you know, where it's like, okay, in each of each of these rooms, you have a guide who's going to tell you what to do. There's some tools, there's some animals, there's some responsibilities, there's some prizes, whatever, you know? And so, yes, in that spirit, I'm happy to play with you. <laughs> Um, I'm putting my Calendly link in the chat. Will you end up with this chat somewhere? Or do you have an um, email you want me to send you stuff to? Or Please. <laughs> what, what's your email? It's Trudy, T-R-U-D-Y, at solutionista.com. S-O-L-U-T-I-O-N-I-S-T-A.com. It's a nice, uh, nice one. Thank you. Real quick, Peter, I was wondering, what are you coding in? Python, Python. And, and a, a little bit of JavaScript. I, I actually, I used to scientists. do, <laughs> I used to, yeah, I used to do JavaScript and I, there's parts of Massive Wiki that need more JavaScript. So maybe I'll be doing both, but Got it. how about you? Um, I'm not coding in anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I used to do LAMP stack and uh, I mean, I've done WordPress recently, uh, but I've been looking into some of the Rust stuff and um, some of the newer, I've been looking into functional programming because I didn't learn that, you know, going to school. Yep. I started with a computer science degree, left it junior year. So like oh, well. <laughs> there is some experience um, with that and, and had my Cisco network programming and learned all the way from basic and HTML and JavaScript and all of those sorts of things, but I don't do it. Like, I don't want to be in there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd rather like manage the, the, the spec and the like, Oh, there's a part over here. There's a piece over there. There's a piece over there <laughs> yeah. rather than documenting and function writing. And yeah, that's not, that's not my world. <laughs> okay. I am oh, signed thanks. up. Thanks, Trudy. We're booked. Thank you. Yeah. She, she's booked up yeah. on my phone. Oh, by the way, Peter, this is awesome. These uh, the HackMD notes. I love this. Uh, looks looks awesome. I I read through it. Thank you so much for, for capturing that information. That's so cool. On on line fifty two, is it okay that I spell it the way I did? On line fifty two. One one fifty two. Hold on, one fifty two. Mine doesn't show a lot. Oh, hold on one second. Is it very okay? very faint over on the left. I'm not seeing it. <laughs> I'm uh, scroll down <laughs> to right above where the Zoom chat is. Oh, oh, over there. Zoom chat. Right above that. SGGs with rhythm. I can't say it the way the way it's supposed to sound, but <laughs> rhythm. SGGs with wit rhythm. <laughs> with rhythm. With rhythm. <laughs> zoom ball. Rhythm. Rhythm. Yes. I like it. That would um, be a good one. I, I yeah, see no, I, I, I hear, I hear like my, I'm like <laughs> all my words captured. I'm like, oh, look, there's me speaking. Talk, 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 talk. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of which, um, uh, we should either otter this or um, I can do it with uh, yeah. AWS or Google. Well, we've got Kiko Labs otters available. So, um, okay. Run it, run it on. I think you cool. even have access to that, Pete. So you, I probably do. Yeah, send it through, or, or um, we 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 coordinate that stuff. No worries. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Agreed. I'll, I'll post the recording link to Telegram. Yes. Awesome. And the, the the Zoom chat. Well, I guess that's maybe in the. I didn't see the HackMD, but if if you could put that there too. I, that would I be... put the Zoom chat into HackMD. Yeah. Perfect. Yay. Uh -huh. you were you were saying something but you were muted you're, and you're still muted 
I was uh, just wanting to drop a link in here since people do stuff like that, um, <laughs> that I sent to Charles earlier that kind of gives an overview of what I've been trying to do with kids and adults. It's, it's like, it's a canvas slideshow. It's, it's not a video, just the slides of, of what I- That, that would be awesome. So let me find that. Don't mind me for a second. You know, I just have to say, I, I've been planting pumpkins and shoveling compost all along here, guys. Oh, and you're so, talking about the real world. That sounds exactly like what we've been doing here, planting. Yeah, I thought you were going on a, a very long metaphorical tangent, but I think, wait, are no, you I mean, actual pumpkins? They're, they're sprouting in the compost. What am I supposed to do? I'm not going to throw them out, you know. <laughs> so that's just, it. <laughs> just, just leave them in there. It's going to take over your whole deck in like six months from now you just you'll have your deck will be covered with vines and pumpkins. yeah 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 i'm gonna train them around the rails and stuff it's, yeah. it's fine <laughs> pumpkins will be dropping on people that walk by underneath well i haven't had success actually with um with yielding the fruit um so much little baby ones come so far but let's see i got a bunch of them here so anyway. they should have pumpkins the size of cherry tomatoes yeah, that's kind of what happened last year. A, a, a little bit like double double cherry tomatoes or something, but but the leaves are, are make a good soup and stuff. Actually, my um, Indian landlord in Queens years ago did that. Um, anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, I I should head out. Uh, does somebody want to take host uh -oh. or or we'll I think wrap we're it good. Off. I think this is pretty saturated. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'm, thanks everybody. I'm almost there with the link. Together. <laughs> oh okay, yeah yeah sorry. well Go you ahead. can also post it in the telegram too yeah if if and when oh or you but you it, know i might not get the telegram you, might not get the telegram <laughs> you can send until to the me flow comes the, around to it you can specify which one in the whatsapp that, that we're on and i can put it in telegram oh you in, have in it, it in whatsapp you could drop it in here right now for that matter <laughs> i don't know which one it is because i didn't even look at, at all my messages yet but i, I, I keep, can do keep going a little bit more trudy okay it's fine i i yeah. Share. <clears throat> Thanks for inviting me into this discussion. Very, very, uh, very awesome discussion. Yeah. Yeah. It's Likewise. really cool. Thank you. Super Pete, great. I guess you don't. You I guess you don't need cool. to be on Clubhouse after all to get the. I know. <laughs> yeah. you get the, we're bringing. The total, we're bringing, uh, bringing the Clubhouse synergy here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The secondhand smoke or something. <laughs> All right, I see it Thanks, now. Judy. Thank All you, right, guys. Good. And this, thank you for having me. This was awesome to see some real faces. And thank you, Charles, for doing all the things that you do that makes me feel like, oh, sure, I could hop on that Zoom, even though my eyes are barely open. <laughs> yes, thank you. Know this the is feeling. great, Charles. Yeah, thank really beautiful. You. Well, yeah, thanks to everyone just for being you. And let's keep being us and let's be us together and all that good stuff. Oh, sounds awesome. Thank you guys you. see my little baby? <laughs> oh, the uh, in the corner. Yeah, yeah she's little, been sleeping over. most of the time. I didn't want to oh. bring it. She just woke up. <laughs> That's a sweetie. Is that a cat? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. My... Hold on. Hello. You're on camera. Wow, oh, she's pretty. Oh, she's big. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. She looks not Thank happy you. to be on camera. The giant Bye, pumpkin. Bye, Bye Sam. Sam. Bye. Bye. Okay. 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 So okay. thank you guys, and I guess we're all out. We're all out. See y'all yeah. later. Okay. In a minute. Let's go.